we'll take a look at the wonderful fall colors of the Upper Peninsula and find out how they get that way. So when chlorophyll starts to poop out, less green, then the yellows and oranges can really shine forth. Cooler the weather and the drier the weather, the better the fall colors are. Sit back, put your feet up and enjoy the show. Nine million acres of forest, 1,700 miles of continuous shoreline, 4,300 lakes, 12,000 miles of streams, more than 300 waterfalls, 15 counties, two time zones, and one area code. Welcome to the Upper Peninsula. Welcome to 906 Outdoors. If you enjoy the outdoors in any way, shape, or form, fall is certainly one of the greatest times of the year. And whether it's hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, it's all done to the backdrop of one of the most unique and breathtaking explosions of natural color imaginable. Maple trees give it one last colorful hurrah before shedding their life-giving leaves for the winter months ahead. The greens of summer are replaced by the orange, reds, and yellows of fall. I wanted to know more about how and why our trees go through this stunning transformation. So I stopped in at the Dickinson Conservation District in Iron Mountain in search of answers. So we're, we're here today to talk a little bit about fall color and I'm going to get a little sciency today because it's kind of, I think it's kind of magical and sciency at the same time. Um, you know, we all, we, we love fall color. It's, it's one of the beauties of, of living in the, in the North Woods. If you think about it, in the tropics there is no fall color. The trees that live in the North part of the temperate zone here where, where we are, they have a certain evolutionary biology that has made them adapted to living in this climate. And part of this climate is that we have a good period of the year that's frozen and cold. And uh, they are not, a, you know, they can't live in those conditions. These deciduous trees, the ones that lose their needles, um, they're, the ground is frozen, they can't absorb water, which what they need for photosynthesis. So they have evolved to basically just pack it up and go home in the fall. And that's what fall colors are about, is basically the packing up and going home of, of trees. Um, deciduous trees have this amazing biology that they're factories of food all summer long. They uh, burst forth in the spring uh, using last year's stored energy that you know, rises up from the, the stored structures, the root structures in the tree, and you know, moves upward um, in, the, in the tree uh, in the response from hormones, actually, that pull it up into the tree. That's the sap flow in the spring. That energy lets all those uh, preformed buds burst open in the, in the spring, early summer, and start photosynthesizing. You get the green leaves that are, that are the food factories of the plant. And the, the real magic happens in the chlorophyll of the, of the plants. That is the, the typically green pigment that you see in leaves all summer long. And chlorophyll is, that's like the, the powerhouse of the whole photosynthetic process. And, you know, people remember from their fifth grade uh, science classes, uh, photosynthesis is uh, carbon dioxide and water mixed with sunlight and, and chlorophyll that drive this interesting reaction that makes actually sugars and uh, oxygen, gives us oxygen to the air. But it's those sugars then that power the tree. They need those sugars, those carbohydrates to grow more and to, um, to set themselves up for next year's, uh, next year's growth again. So they're always kind of banking it forward. They bank these sugars forward into the next year so that they can continue their survival. You know, in a, in a tree, and I'm not trying to humanize trees, but survival of any biological organism is of, of importance. So they have mechanisms to ensure their survival and, and banking sugars for next year is one of them. Today's show is brought to you in part by Rapid River Knife Works home of Michigan's largest custom knife factory showroom. Back to the old chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is green all summer long, but what most people don't recognize about chlorophyll is that they, that chlorophyll is kind of, uh, kind of wimpy in, in a way. It has to be, it, it fades in, in response to sunlight. So you'd think that the sunlight that it uses and, and motivates it to make uh, the, the sugars, that it, it lasts a little bit longer, 
But if you can picture putting a piece of construction paper out in the sunlight for a week or so, you'll notice that it would fade a lot. Or if you go down the road and look at a, a flag banner, you'll see how it fades in the sunlight. Well, those are all pigments that fade in the sunlight, much like chlorophyll fades with sunlight. It actually uh, photodegrades. So the tree all summer long is having to remake new chlorophyll. But what happens towards the end of the year is that as, as fall comes on, the night, night length gets longer. And so trees have photosensors that actually sense the amount of darkness. It, it seems odd not to talk about the amount of daylight, but it's really it's the darkness that's the critical thing to trees. They, they sense the amount of darkness, and as those, the length of the darkness uh, extends, you know, day by day after fall starts and late summer starts, um, they start another process in their leaves where they actually start changing the, the base of their leaves. So, you know, leaves are attached to the stem. What happens at the base of the leaf is, is that the cells start changing. They multiply. They form kind of a corky layer. It's called the abscission layer, the layer that's going to cause it to fall off eventually. And typically in a leaf, you know, f food's being generated here, carbohydrates, and they're moving through the, the petiole here into the stem, down the stem, all the way to the, to the roots. And you know, there's a constant energy exchange. But as this layer starts to change, that whole process starts to slow down. So no longer is food being moved back and forth out of the leaf. What's happening in the leaf is kind of stuck in the leaf at that time. And the chlorophyll isn't regenerated anymore. There's not enough energy to make new chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll starts to just fade away. And what happens then is the other pigments that have been hanging around in the leaf most of the summer, uh, or all summer, start to become more apparent. The two uh, pigments that are in the leaf all summer long, along with the green chlorophyll, are xanthophylls, which are yellow, and carotenoids, with, which are orange. So those two other pigments are housed also in vacuoles of the uh, leaf. They actually have a supporting role to the chlorophyll. They help absorb energy and shunt it into the chlorophyll to help it do its job more efficiently. So those, those, those pigments are hanging out in the leaf all summer long, but you don't see them because chlorophyll is dominant. You know, it absorbs all the other colors, but it reflects green, so that's why you see it as green. So when chlorophyll starts to poop out, less green, then the yellows and oranges can really uh, shine forth. They're basically a sign that, okay, chlorophyll's done. It's, the, the leaf is done making sugars for the year for the most part it's on its way out, that corky layer has started to form, and, and we're on our way out now. For us, it's beauty. For the leaf, it's kind of a, just a practical succession in, in its growth. It needed those two pigments during the summertime as energy boosters, essentially, but now there's really nothing to use them for, so they, they, they get to shine their colors a little bit. You know, anybody who's observed fall color knows that some trees turn brilliant red, some never turn red. Some have years where they're better red than others. Some have years where the, the leaves just really don't do too much at all. These are two different tree species, this is sugar maple and red maple. Red maples genetically have a lot of uh, anthocyanin production. That's what makes the red. So there's a third pigment involved. And the anthocyanins are the same thing that um, color beets and blueberries, you know, everybody has a, a good association with those red food colors of beets, anthocyanins, antioxidants, good things for you. Anthocy anthocyanins are the tricky one. So it, uh, it is not in the leaf all summer long, like the, the yellows and the orange chemicals are. The, the red anthocyanin pigment doesn't show up until the fall, and there's a lot of debate exactly on why and how that formulation ha uh, happens. But uh, some of the theories are is that as the chlorophyll stops doing its, its action of uh, making new sugars, the sugars are kind of more concentrated in the stem, the leaf chemistry changes, the phosphate level changes, and it triggers the formation of anthocyanins. There's all kinds of cool theories on what the anthocyanins do, and one of them is that it might actually squeeze out the last bit of sugars and help kind of protect the leaf a little bit more it might protect the last of the chlorophyll that's still doing a little bit of photosynthesis in the leaf. Um, might kind of make, kind of boost its job just a little bit right at the end. It might help shunt a few more sugars out of the leaf, make that a little bit more efficient. Another theory is that if, uh, 
If an insect sees a red leaf, it signals in, a, in an insect, for instance, aphids are one of the things that are talked about frequently. Aphids have an adaptive ecology also that tells them that a red colored leaf is not suitable for it to overwinter on, that it's, it has a, a different set of chemicals in it that are not favorable to its growth. Usually the pH level is a little bit different, that sort of thing. So if a leaf is particularly red, it signals to insects that this is not a good place to lay your eggs to overwinter for the wintertime. Uh, another theory I read is that when the red leaves fall on the ground, anthocyanins actually act as uh, growth inhibitors to other species that might fall under, underneath that tree. Because remember, trees have a biology that it makes them try to reproduce themselves. And uh, some trees and some other plants have this interesting biology that they actually exude chemicals that decrease the competition. Nine Hundred Six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Crist, your Northwoods neighborhood store. The brighter the sunlight, the cooler the weather, and the drier the weather, weather the better the fall colors are. That's because there's so much sunlight that the remember that the leaves are still forming their little abscission layer. The, the leaves have already been triggered to start shutting off the sugars and slowing things down. Um, the chlorophyll is fading though. Bright sun makes chlorophyll fade and no new chlorophyll is being made so the other colors come out better. So that bright sunlight actually makes the colors of yellow, orange, and red show up a little bit faster and more vividly. On the flip side we've had a lot of rain this year and Rain means that these trees are still happy. Uh, a stressed tree starts this whole process of shutting down the works, sending the sugars to the roots, calling it quits for the year a little bit earlier. You know, you, if we have a really drought summer, you'll see that happen in August even. That's uh, kind of the whole tree's um, biology to, ah, we're done for this year, it's too dry, we can't really support our, the leaves that we have, so let's Let's fold the tents, send the sugars down to the roots, and wait for next year. We've got our buds ready for next year. This year we've had so much moisture that trees kept on growing vividly, you know, actively through August and into early September. You know, half of our weeks have been rain and, and cloudy, so a little bit less sunlight, uh, very uh, much moisture. They're probably they're still doing a little bit of photosynthesis. So I think you're going to see a little bit more delayed and maybe not quite as vibrant a color. But uh, you certainly see the trees that got lots and lots of sunlight towards the end of the year, those are the ones that tend to be most vivid. If you look at the whole canopy of the tree, it's the outer leaves that are the, the reddest and the most colorful oftentimes. Those are the ones that got the most light, means that the chlorophyll degraded because of the, the large amount of light that they had on them. So on any leaf, you can see kind of the whole process where it, it doesn't happen all at the same time sometimes. Uh, it's a progression. There's still a little bit of chlorophyll still uh, surviving there, probably because it was just shaded. This part of the leaf was shaded just a little bit more from the leaf above it. You can almost kind of see, you know, from the direction of the sunlight, that's exactly where the shade is on that leaf. That's where there still is some green chlorophyll. You'll notice that some trees never get red. You know, that, and that's, there's a genetic thing in trees that they never do make anthocyanins. You never see a, you know, birch or popple don't ever turn red. Um, so there's certain genetics in trees that um, must in, inhibit the anthocyanin production. They don't need to for some reason. It's not part of their biology. They don't make anthocyanins. They stop with the, the carotenoids and the xanthophils and, and call it good. Um, that's interesting. It's like a, you're never gonna, you don't get a black golden retriever, you know, that, that sort of thing. There's genetics that also sway it. From one plant to the next, you'll have some trees. I can think of, everybody can probably think of a tree that they know that consistently is a brilliant, just brilliant orange red in the fall. Only one on the block, maybe. It's, it's always good. There's genetics, you know, that individual seed genetics that make that tree particularly prone to good anthocyanin production, you know, these other chemicals being really uh, potent in the leaves. Another one of the things we get calls on in the fall is, is that actually some of the evergreens are starting to turn yellow and lose their needles. So the, another thing we need to kind of be aware of is that evergreens 
do lose needles as well. It's a little more subtle. The pines are the ones that it's, it's most obvious on. But if you look at the inner needles, the bottom couple inches are turning yellow. That's the biology of a conifer is that they too have a balance of energy. Their biology is that they keep their needles on throughout the winter time. They have to support those needles. So they have to still have enough moisture to support those needles and, and keep them kind of in a resting state at least in the winter time. They're not super active, but uh, their roots are frozen. So there's not a lot of movement happening. So they kind of cut their losses a little bit every year. They, they jettison the oldest needles and keep the most active, uh, strong needles at the tips of the branches. So uh, don't be concerned if you walk through a pine forest uh, about this time of the year and you see it littered with yellow pine needles and you look up and you go, oh my gosh, what's happening? That's natural too. If you look at an old red pine, it's always kind of bare of needles on the inside of the branch. Those needles aren't getting much sunlight anymore. So their opportunity to, to photosynthesize is, is kind of gone. So why support those needles? And the last most interesting tree that you, you think about is the conifer that loses its, all, all its needles, the deciduous conifer, the tamarack. They're usually the, one of the last things to actually lose its, change color and lose its, its needles. And you notice they're always beautiful gold. You never see a red tamarack. They're always beautiful gold. That's, that's their uh, genetics is that they're going to be gold. And it's one of the few conifers in our well, I think it's the only one that I can think of. The only conifer in the temperate zone that we live in, the north zone that we live in here, that loses its needles. And that's its biology. It's a conifer, but it's programmed to lose all its needles and start over again in the, in the spring. I, I try not to humanize trees, you're not, you know, but when you think about their biology and how they work, it really is an amazing am amount of factory that's, that's working within that tree and uh, in response to hormones and daylight and darkness and you know it, you know the weather conditions they re, they can react to things because they have sensitive cells in them that that are uh, sensitive to daylight and darkness um, and they need water and they you know they have a uh, they need fuel and energy so it's kind of like a, if you think of it as a factory that has needs resources to make its product and if it lacks resources well it goes a different direction it's, it'll, it'll, it'll have a layoff for a while if, you know, if it uh, doesn't have enough resources to, to uh, do its full function. Nine oh six Outdoors is brought to you in part by Blades Bait and Tackle, your year-round connection to fishing bait and knock. I'm always amazed at how short a distance I need to travel to end up in some amazing place here in the Upper Peninsula. And in the fall, everything is just a bit more spectacular, more vivid, more UP. There are several pre-designated routes to follow that will certainly offer up some of the best colors found across the peninsula. Or you can pretty much just jump in the car, head off in any direction, and find something unique. Patty and I hit the road and simply headed west. We ended up in the Launce area. I'll leave you today with a look at some of the wonders of the UP that we ran across. Mm -hmm. 